The joy over one sinner that repents. I have argued several times throughout this series now that nowhere does the Bible teach repent of your sins to be saved for eternal life. And in the previous video we looked at Luke chapter 5 where Jesus uh, comes to call sinners to repentance. And he was defending himself to the Pharisees as to why he was banqueting with publicans and sinners. In Luke chapter 15 we have another example of Jesus defending himself to the Pharisees for dining with publicans and sinners. When we explored Luke 5 we saw that Jesus was doing the calling. He was doing the action that resulted in sinners converted onto repentance. However, in Luke 15, we actually have a mixture of Jesus doing the action and the sinners themselves doing the action across various parables. So in verse 7, it says that there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Likewise, also in verse 10, it says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Out of all the verses in the Bible, these two are arguably the closest thing that you're going to find to the idea of repenting of sins for salvation. Something that we're supposed to do for everlasting life. So people will cite this verse and say, see, there it is. It says it right there. Repent of your sins. Now normally, based on previous videos I've done, this is the part where I would point out to people that it doesn't actually say of his sins, but then people would point out the noun and say that this sets the context of repentance, which is true. So we do see in context that sinners need to repent. This is not telling righteous people to repent. This is not telling unbelievers to repent. This is not telling pagans to repent. This is not telling Jews to repent. This is not telling Gentiles to repent. This is not telling grace haters or legalistic works trusters to repent. This is not telling lordshippers to repent. It is telling sinners to repent. First, let's consider for a moment what is a sinner. Well, the answer is obvious. A sinner is somebody who sins, just like a liar is somebody who lies and an adulterer is somebody who commits adultery. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us the outcome of being the type of person who does these things. It says in 1 Corinthians 6 in verses 9 and 10 that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. So people will say, well, see, there it is. We have this list of sins in 1 Corinthians 6, and if you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Or in other words, you won't have everlasting life. Sorry, but it's not checkmate yet, because this same passage from Corinthians also tells us what the remedy is for sinners to become converted. Paul goes on to say that such were some of you, but... So, you were sinners, you were fornicators, you were adulterers, you were drunkards, you were murderers, but how were you converted from being these things? You are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul did not say, you have repented of your sins. Paul did not say, you have stopped sinning. Paul did not say, you have surrendered your life, denied yourself, and made Jesus the Lord of your life. These statements wouldn't actually be true, by the way, because in the previous chapter, Paul rebuked this church for tolerating fornication in the church. But that doesn't negate the fact that he said, such were some of you, fornicators, but you are washed. In other words, any sinful dirt you accumulated was simply wiped off. You are justified. You have a good reason for inheriting the kingdom. You are sanctified. You are set apart from those in verses 9 and 10 who have not been washed or justified. And all that's because of the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. Your turning from sins has no relevance. This is very consistent with the previous video. When we looked at Jesus saying, I came to call sinners to repentance, we saw what the medicine described by the good physician was in that chapter. The medicine prescribed by the physician for sinners is, believe on Christ. Christ died for us. Christ's obedience alone. Lord, be merciful to me. Be justified by Christ. Jesus came into the world to save us. So by comparing scripture with scripture, we can see how sinners repent. They repent by the fact that through believing in Jesus, he saves them. Jesus washes them. Jesus justifies them. Their own obedience of works and changing their lifestyle really has nothing to do with it. But the repent of your sins to be saved crowd do have a card up their sleeve. So whereas I might say, sinners repenting in Luke 15, 7 and 10 means to be washed, justified and sanctified by God, by cross-referencing it with 1 Corinthians 6, the repent of your sins advocate could use the switch card on me and say that being washed, justified and sanctified in 1 Corinthians 6 actually means repenting of sin, if we cross-reference it 
with Luke 15, 7 and 10. But I have one card left up my sleeve as well. All we have to do is go to Luke 15, and the parables will define sinners repenting. How and what do they do to repent? So the first parable in Luke 15 is that of the shepherd. Remember, Jesus is defending himself, again, to the Pharisees for dining and eating with sinners and publicans. Very similar to what we looked at in the previous video when he went to Levi's house. It says in Luke 15 verses 4 to 6, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. So there's a few observations that we can take from this parable. Observation number one is that the lost sheep represents the sinner that repents in this illustration. Now, the lost sheep is not described as taking any action itself, other than that it was lost and is now found. The second observation is that the shepherd does the actual work or action in this parable. He goes out for the sheep, he finds the sheep, he brings the sheep back to his flock, the sheep did not repent of its own accord. So we see a very similar pattern to the previous video when we looked at Luke 5, Sinners to Repentance. We saw that Jesus was doing the calling, Jesus was the good physician, and now Jesus is the good shepherd. In this parable, the lost sheep repents. That is, it turns from being a lost sheep to be a found sheep. Not because the sheep itself did any actual action or willful change of direction, but because the shepherd went out to rescue and recover it. It was the shepherd that actually caused the repenting to happen. Now, if this parable was all about turning from your sins, you would expect it to say something like, the sheep wandered off from its flock, but then it saw the wolf coming, and so it got scared, ran back to safety, came back to the safety of its flock, started, uh, you know, huddling with fear against the shepherd, and started being real nice to the other sheep, and from that point on, he never left the shepherd's sight. That would be a more appropriate parable if that was the case but Jesus didn't use that parable. There's no behavioural course correction being suggested in this parable. The third observation is that while a lot of Christians interpret the parable of the lost sheep as meaning losing salvation and getting it back again, it is not evident that Jesus used this parable to justify why he was speaking to and eating with backsliding Jews. He was using it to justify going out and reaching the people that we normally perceive to belong to the outside, not the inside. So this is interesting because the literal carnal in, in understanding of what Jesus is doing in this chapter is that he's going out and reaching the lost, people that we would normally perceive to not belong to Christ initially, people who are on the outside, and he gets them saved and adopted into the family of God. But then the parable that he uses to illustrate what he is doing here is that he's going out to fetch something that is currently lost, but technically already belonged to him in the first place. So those who are destined to be saved, eventually, who are currently sinners, who were born in sin, already belong to Jesus. He is simply going out and reaching for what already belongs to him. But seeing him go out to reach the lost is simply the earthly manifestation of what has already happened in heavenly places. Now, Christians will have variances and disagreements over the subject of predestination versus free will, which I'm not going to get into in this video. But whatever your views about that, the point in this parable here is that one way or another, it is established that by reaching sinners, Jesus is only gathering what does technically already belong to him. But there is a process of reaching the lost where this is made manifest that we can see it happening. So it's not up to the sheep to just randomly wander in all of these different flocks, checking out who's in charge, and hopefully finding the right one, and then asking that shepherd if they can join the flock. That's not how shepherding works. Sheep are property. They belong to somebody. So the shepherd is going out and getting his property. Now, the next parable in Luke 15 of the lost coin is very similar to that of the lost sheep. Jesus goes on to say, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbours together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. So once again, we see a very similar pattern in this parable that we saw with the sheep parable, the lost sheep. Coins don't really make choices in a literal application of the parable. They don't have opinions. They don't sin. The lost coin did not jump out of the window of the house, roll down the hill and accumulate all this dirt from all of its sinful behaviour, but then jump back in and bounce into a barrel of vinegar to clean itself up again so it could be presented back to its owner. Now, obviously, that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but that would be a more appropriate parable if this was all about you turning from your sins. 
Instead, the woman in the parable, who we could say represents Jesus, but if you're uncomfortable with the idea of a woman representing Jesus, then you could just say that she represents his evangelistic servants, if you like. She's doing all the work to find this lost coin. She is searching for it. She is going high and low to find it, and she rejoiced upon finding it. But all the work and credit for finding it is hers alone. The coin did not do anything of its own achievement. So once again, just like with the lost sheep, if this parable represents sinners repenting, well then these sinners did not repent by turning from all of their sins and cleaning up their filthy lives. Sinners repent by having the rightful owner come and find them while they are yet lost and bringing them back to themselves, to their owners. That is the repentance. Jesus going out to find them and then collecting them brings them back where they belong, his rightful property. So we see that the two parables describing sinners repenting interpret the meaning as those who were lost but are found by Jesus, not those who cleaned up their life and then came to Jesus. Now this is where it starts to get interesting because although Jesus doesn't use the phrase sinner that repents again, he does still continue the idea with the next parable which is that of the prodigal son. Things take a bit of a different spin in this parable because this time it's the sinner that does the actual repenting. The father is not doing the action in this illustration per se, or at least that's what it would look like at first glance. So this could turn everything that we've just seen on its head, but let's take a look. So I'm just going to quickly summarise it because most of you will know the story anyway. The younger brother took his half of the inheritance and spent it all on riotous living. Then he spent all of his money and there was a famine. He resorted to feeding pigs for a living, he was hungry, and so he realised he would be better off at his father's house. He then says to himself what he will say to his father when he returns. I have sinned against heaven and before you, and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as a servant. Now this is the bit where they'll all say, he repented of all of his sins. Er, uh, no he didn't. If we take an honest assessment of the parable, and don't try to force our doctrine onto it, we can actually see some very interesting observations. First of all, his motives for returning to the father were actually quite selfish. He wasted his substance with riotous living, verse 13. A famine struck the land, this was completely beyond his own control, verse 14. He had a humiliating job that didn't afford him enough to eat. He knew that his father's servants were much better fed and paid, verses 15 to 17. So the only reason he went to his father in the first place was that he ran out of money to indulge in his riotous living. He was hungry. If these situations didn't come upon him, he might not have returned to the father. Since God is ultimately in control of whether there is a famine or not, God's intervention had at least partially contributed to the son's return. The second observation is that if we look at what he intends to say to his father, he only intends to confess his sin, that is, admit or acknowledge that he has sinned, as it is written, I will say unto my father. He doesn't make any commitment to never sin again. He does not list all of his sins. He does not intend to feign crying out in sackcloth and ashes. In the previous video in this series, when we looked at John the Baptist's repentance, we saw how the Gospels only tell us that people confessed their sins. It doesn't tell us that they repented or turned from their sins uh, or forsook their sins. No such backstory is given. Other supporting verses might include 1 John 1 9. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It doesn't say repent of them. And when it says confess, it doesn't mean like a Catholic style confession, you know, or listing all of your sins verbally. It's basically, it's the opposite of deny, okay? So the opposite of confessing sin is saying that we have not sinned or we have no sin, as 1 John 1 explains. And I've done a study video about that. You can find that on my channel if you need more information about that. Finally, we will also see something very interesting when the father sees him afar off. It says in verse 20, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father expressed great compassion merely upon seeing the prodigal son coming towards him. The son has not even confessed his sin yet. The father does not wait to cautiously test his repentance to make sure he is genuinely sorrowful first. This is consistent with the gospel of grace by faith without works. It is not consistent with the repent of your sins false gospel, where advocates demand to see your genuine repentance with sorrow and pig squeals before you can come to Jesus. In the next verse, the son will confess his sin against heaven and against his father's sight, but this is after the father has already seen the son first and had compassion on him first. Now you might ask why the big bold red cattle letters there. Well, it's for emphasis. 
Remember that in the first two parables, the sinner's repentance was according to Jesus finding them, not them correcting themselves first. The parable of the prodigal son only superficially looks like it is the son that does the important action for his repentance, but his motives were actually quite selfish. When we investigate further, we can see that the father saw him first and had compassion on him first. Now, there's this false prophet out there called Keith Wheeler. You may know him as Y City Preachers, and he says this. It's not about us accepting Jesus. It's not about us accepting Jesus. It's about Jesus accepting you. And he's only going to accept those who repent and forsake all known sin. Well, what that unsaved moron says is not consistent with the parable, is it? The repent of your sins message makes the gospel all about you. You have to correct your behaviour, you have to forsake everything that God hates, and you have to learn to love what God loves, etc, etc. But the reality is that, once again, all the credit goes to the Father for accepting the Son with compassion before the Son has had chance to confess, before the Son has demonstrated any intention of self-correction or repenting, before the Son even expresses any love or regret to his Father, the Father invites him in and is glad just at the sight of him alone. This parable is consistent with grace through faith without works. It is not consistent with work salvation. It is not consistent with repenting of your sins for salvation. Now, some people will say to me, just because he didn't clean up his behaviour before coming to the Father doesn't mean he should not, could not or did not clean up his act after returning to the Father. You don't think he went back to his old sinful ways again, do you? Well, the simple fact of the matter is, your fictional narrative and embellished storytelling is not relevant, William Fakespeare. The parable does not go on to tell us what kind of life the prodigal son lived after returning to the father. Jesus did not mention his later life, therefore it is not relevant to the parable. You know, you can't just add your own sensational story writing to parables just because they don't fit your narrative or because they're not compatible with your false gospel. And by the way, that's what these repent of your sins types do constantly. They constantly embellish these passages with their additional story writing and narrative that isn't there. So in summary, according to these three parables, sinners repent by being found by God and by being seen and loved by God when he sees us afar off. Not by cleaning up their life, forsaking all and submitting to his lordship. Now, when you're saved, I hope that you do clean up your life and surrender to his lordship, whatever that even means. But that's not the cause of why the Father loves you. The Father loves you because he is a loving Father and you're his son. That's the reason. That's the only reason. Now, what's interesting is that rather like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' teaching here in Luke spans across several chapters. So if we carry on reading into Luke 16, we will get to the account of the rich man who's burning in hell while Lazarus is resting in Abraham's bosom. And assuming you're familiar with the story, the rich man appeals to Abraham to send Lazarus back to the world to testify unto his brethren so that they would not end up in the place where the rich man is currently in torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he, the rich man, said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went up from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So let's suppose they had listened to Moses and the prophets. How would they have repented? Well, they would have turned from all of their sins, not what it says. It says they would have been persuaded. This is perfectly consistent with the rest of the Bible. For example, in Acts chapter 26, Paul tells Agrippa about the message of repentance he preached unto Damascus and at Jerusalem. That was in verse 20. And then in verse 28, King Agrippa said to him, Almost you persuade me to be a Christian. There it is. There's that persuasion. And persuasion by the law and mo of Moses and the prophets is just like we see in Luke 16. It's synonymous with believing because we also see this two chapters later in Acts 28. It says that persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses, it goes on to say, some believed. So there it is. There's the persuasion. It's believing. That's the repentance in Luke chapter 16. Persuasion. Another supporting verse, which doesn't use the word persuade, but is very similar in defining repentance in this way, is 2 Timothy 2.25, where it says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So a very similar idea to persuasion, acknowledging what is true, being persuaded by it, believing. So then, how do sinners repent? Why does heaven have so much joy over the sinner that repents? What happens? Well, Jesus recovers what belongs to him, 
The father sees the son afar off and has compassion on him long before the son says anything to him and the law of, the, of Moses and the prophets persuades them to acknowledge the truth. That's how sinners repent. That's how the Bible defines sinners repenting. Now these repent of your sins messengers, they redefine repentance of sinners because they reject the Bible and they want to take all the credit for being saved. It's that simple. This is no nonsense Christianity reminding you that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins to be saved.